Hi friends, welcome back to the channel. This video will be the part two of the going through my chemistry IA video. If you're new here, my name is Cindy. I graduated from an IB school with a score of 44 points and I'll be studying biomedical sciences at university this fall. Consider subscribing for more content related to the IB or my university life. I really appreciate that you guys watch my videos and support my content. Okay, so now let's start off with the data collection section of my I8. What I have to say here is do collect everything. If you make a solution, collect the mass of solutes you measured out. Collect the volume of water you added to, I don't know, the volumetric flask. Collect everything. You might ask why. You need to collect the uncertainties, note the uncertainties, include it down, take into consideration of humor errors as part of the uncertainties, and then you need to propagate those uncertainties when you do your calculation. In my table one, I am trying to make specific concentration of a solution for my iodine titrant. Instead of just saying the final solution I made is like 0.005 moles per dm cubed, I included the mass of the solute and also the volume of water I added into the volumetric flask. As you can see on all of them, I included the uncertainties. You might ask like, you how do you know what but the you need amount to consider of uncertainty is? Some for example, example for 100% like iodine pellets, I have 0.01 measurements. The how do they will depend on the equipment you use? For example, the, the comparison of dust using measured beaker out and using a pipe. A beaker it is the least accurate uh, measuring device in the science field, while a pipette is much more accurate. With that said, the uncertainty of a beaker will be much more greater than the uncertainty of the pipette. And not just between different equipment, even between different types of pipette. So we have pipette that can measure up to 10 mil, you have pipette that, uh, that can measure up to 5 mil or 1 mil, and each of these pipettes have different uncertainties. The 10 mil pipette will have a much larger uncertainty than the 1 mil pipette. With that said, your determination of which equipment to use is crucial and it will affect greatly on like the precision and how reliable your answer is. And other than equipment, in terms of uncertainties, something you need to take in consideration when you decide what the uncertainty of this measurement is, is human errors. And there's multiple types of human errors. This is a mistake that I didn't write in my IA. I knew that while I was writing my IA, but because I did include it at the beginning, I only like noticed like that human error is insignificant. After I finished my calculations, I was so busy that I decided it was more worth it if I spend those time working on my other IAs and study for my mock exams rather than making that change. So it was an informed decision for me to like not include that, but if you're just starting, definitely include that so you don't need to do your calculations twice. And in terms of what human errors mean, this could be something like the parallax error. That means, for example, when you are reading the change in the volume of titrant, because if you've done a titration, you know that there's an initial volume and there's a final volume. And because when you read the volume, like you can read it like slightly above or slightly below, and that will affect the measurement that you eventually record it down. If you are doing titration like me, even though it's not the same experiment, take that into consideration. And some other types of human errors could be something like reaction time. When you are timing a reaction, the second that you see the reaction stop and the, the time that you actually press like stop on the timer will actually have a delay. How accurate do you think your reaction time is? And you need to justify that and include it into your uncertainties. Another type of error that is very common in titration is the degree of color change in your titration. Even in terms of permanent color change, it might be different every time. Sometimes there's, there might be an additional shade of gray in the volume when there's a permanent color change, sometimes where there isn't. And that could be because like, you added like one or two more drops of titrant that, would, that led to the extra shade of gray. These are stuff that I did not take into consideration of when I like tried to write down my uncertainty. So don't make my mistake and do that in your IA. If you're confused with what uncertainties are, the IB provided a lot of information in the teacher support material and there's a section called errors and uncertainties and I'll link the website in the description so you guys can check it out and find out the expectations from the IB. In terms of justifying like your uncertainties, as you can see I don't have one in my IA but another YouTuber, Sinead Sikurda, in her chemistry IA she did have another section where she talked about why she decided on a specific uncertainty 
please do, you guys can check it out. She scored a 20 out of 24 for her IA and she made it available for everyone. And table 2 is more of my raw data table, but if you pay close attention, there's actually processed data here. And the reason for that is because when I did titration in my class, my teacher always wanted us to include a column where we actually put processed data. So that's why I did it, but it is known by the IB that it's very confusing when students put raw data and processed data together. So that might have impacted my communication points. At least what I did, I included the initial burette reading and the final burette reading, which they reported that students offer forget to do that so this is good like definitely do include the initial and final bureau reading even though i have processed data i did have a section like below that where i justified why i wanted to process the data and how i process the data and so yeah i forgot to talk in terms of the caption for each tables and stuff you need a title for each of your tables because that is required by the ib or else you will lose communication points and for data tables, something to always note is for the data that you actually collect so for example in the, this first row, I have 22.5. Make sure it matches the decimal places of the uncertainty that you recorded. And something you might want to note from this table too is that I also included the measurement for the temperature of the sample. And I included an uncertainty and then, oh shoot, it should be 20.0 degrees Celsius. Why did I measure the temperature of the sample? Because that was the control variable that I have written. The temperature of the sample when the titration took place. I needed to make sure that I measure the control variable and make sure that it's the same every single time. Often with something that you conduct in room temperature, you cannot just say all the experiment was conducted in the same conditions in the same classroom, so therefore the temperature was the same. No, it doesn't work like this. Even in the same room, in the same environment, even at the same period of time, the room temperature fluctuates. So you need to measure every single time when you do the experiment. You cannot just assume that it's always, always, always the same. You need to have a method of measuring your control variables and making sure it's the same every time. Here, you might have noticed, like, why do I have trial 8, 9, 11, and 12? The reason is for titration, what you often do is that you conduct as many trials as possible, and then you only select trials that have a change in volume titrant that's within plus or minus 0.1 mil. Let me just close my appendix so you can actually see like what's happening. So here I actually have all my trials. Trials that I shaded in blue are the trials that I actually included in the calculation. This is not cherry picking data because this is part of the methodology of titration. The reason why you want plus or minus 0.1 mil is this is the process that reduces random errors because titration in terms of color change, color change can be a very subjective interpretation. So you need to make sure that when you determine color change it's rather consistent so this is almost like to ensure precision over accuracy and it's just part of the methodology in conducting titration so this was okay definitely make sure like if you're doing other types of calculation rate of reaction whatever you cannot cherry pick data you cannot say this is an outlier so i'm not including it if that's the case you need to explain why yeah so that's it for my data collection i think students do make a lot of mistakes here in this section so Please learn from what I did, also learn from my mistakes. And in terms of data collection, always, always, always include qualitative data because it is, again, noted by the IB that very few students were able to note good observations and some students, they just included images and then just expect the examiner to be able to interpret it. You can include images like I did. I did it in a table format, but as you can see, I have descriptions below it and not just include a picture and expect the examiner to know what I'm thinking. And overall for data collection, in terms of quantitative data collection, make sure you at least have five independent variables and make sure they have like the same intervals, like the same segments in between. And then make sure you have at least three trials. I personally think at least five trials because it is noted from subject reports that students often come to a conclusion with a very limited amount of data. And actually, in my case, even though I, I did so many trials, but the actual ones that I can include are only like, I don't know, four or five for each independent variable. So that might have not been enough and that could have been where I lost marks again. If you can, overall, like separate data collection and data presentation and have data process in between. In my case, I felt like because it was a titration experiment, I felt like it was necessary to include the process data in my data collection table, but most of the time, 
like to separate them and have data processing in between. And next, moving on to data processing. To be honest, I think data processing is pretty straightforward, but something that people just often forget or do wrong is uncertainties, again, and error propagation. And so on screen here, I'll put some common mistakes uh, made with uncertainties as noted by the IB subject report. So if you're not really sure on how to do uncertainties, look at the chemistry teacher support material. And again, it's linked down in the description. It's just something that's so confusing and I hate doing it but they care about it so much like if you don't know examiners will actually go through your calculations and calculate it and see if it's right and when your teacher give you your first draft um, feedback they are supposed to go through all of your calculations and make sure it's right don't rely on a teacher it's entirely your responsibility to perform the right calculations and check your calculations over and over again. So in terms of data processing, there's not a lot to talk about here. Some suggestions I can give is to organize by subheadings, like what I did here with bullet points, and I even have sub subheading. And I think this just allow the examiner to follow your calculations a lot more easier. And keep in mind, like different people do stoichiometry differently. Include headings, subheadings to help them see like what you're doing in the section. So moving on to my data presentation, as you can see, I have two different types of presentation. So as you can see here, I presented my processed data in two different forms, like in terms of the unit of moles or the units of milligrams per 100 grams. In terms of the moles values, I still included it here because technically it is processed data as well. And so after that, I then have a graph. Um, this was enough to see the nature of relationship between these two. I think you definitely need a line of best fit because this is definitely something you will need to refer back to when you do your conclusion and analysis. And yes, in terms of error bars, lines of best fit and error bars were used inappropriately sometimes or used poorly. You need to specify what the error bar is about. Like what does your error bar represent? So in this case, my error bar was showing my uncertainty. Like I feel like sometimes like you're so indulged like in your own IA, you expect other people to know what you already know when it's actually not the case. And something you also need to be aware about is the labels on the x-axis and the y-axis. The decimal places need to match the decimal places of your uncertainty. That matches the one decimal place of my plus or minus 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. Some of you might ask like why didn't you calculate a standard deviation here? Because it is often done in I don't know experiments like in biology um, IAs as well and the reason is like this is similar to like the nature of my experiment where like for titration you just need to have a plus or minus 0 0.1 situation for all the data that you include in your calculation. If I already chose data that's between plus or minus 0 0.1, there isn't a need to like calculate the extent of deviation for a group as a whole. This will definitely vary between different types of experiment. So talk to your teachers and use your independent thinking to decide whether or not this calculation is suitable for your particular IA. It's good that less people are doing standard deviation analysis because often its significance is uh, poorly understood. Moving on to conclusion analysis section, mine was really long. I wrote so much. I can write a lot. Instead of like going through what I wrote step by step, I'm just going to give like some general tips on what you can do with your conclusion analysis section and then you guys can, I don't know, read mine on your own time to get some inspiration and to get a sense of the structure of my conclusion and analysis section. A lot of people spent a lot of time just describing their data and not enough time interpreting their data and then actually make some meaning out of it. The suggestion I would give here is to spend I think 10 to 15 percent of this section describing your data, describing the trend, like note some observations, and the remaining percentage of your um, conclusions and analysis section actually interpreting the data, like trying to unpack it and explain what these data mean and how they answer your research question. Remember I said before how you will need a line of best fit because like you will need to refer back to it and explain what does like the equation of the line of best fit tell you so in this case i wrote it like here in third paragraph of my ia just read it on your own time in my second paragraph i talked about my original hypothesis again because i think like just referring back to your original hypothesis and explain if it supported it or if it not supported it or partially supported it. and another thing that you need to do in this section is to compare your data to other research or prior findings 
or other scientific context. And so in here, I talked about like other research and I compared my findings to other research. Finally, at the end, what you need to do is to answer your research question. In my case, like it was a how did it affect something like it was a how question. I need to answer the how question. It's better to have something like how instead of something like which and like what because that limits your answer to a yes or no is this or that type of answer. So a how question is much more broad and you get to talk a lot more in terms of the sciencey thing on how the IV affects the DV. So yeah, I, I really don't have a lot to talk about in this section because everyone's IA is different and everyone will have written different things in this section depending on the nature of your question. So now let's move on to the evaluation section. In this section, my teacher gave me a 4 out of 6, which I think I should have at least gotten a 5 out of 6, but before I got into the strengths and limitations, which are the two important things that you need to talk about in your evaluation, I have two paragraphs where I talked about like how my methodology helped me to achieve my goal, that is to answer the research question. And I just basically explained why the methodology was suitable, how did it produce like reliable results, like enough results, and what are some things that I did that I try to improve the methodology to like achieve better results. So in terms of strengths, I always like found that it was more difficult to list out strengths of my methodology compared to the limitations of my methodology. There's always like some strengths, like whether you know it or not. And sometimes in this case, it's again, like I often say this, that is to note the obvious. Something that you think is something that you automatically have to do may actually be a strength of your IA. In terms of like strengths and limitations, usually it's procedural, but it can also be other things like the materials you use. In this case, I use an iodine titrate. You could have used like DCPIP or something like other forms of titration to do that. Like, why didn't you do that? And then in terms of the limitations, in this, just in this section overall, you also need to talk about systematics or like random errors. So in this case, as you can see, for each of my limitations, I labeled it as a systematic error or a random error. And this is a thing that I saw a lot of people did in their IA, so I just incorporated that into mine. And and also something you need to talk about is precision and accuracy. And this is something that I didn't talk about as much in my evaluation section. So it could have led to a lower mark overall, especially for limitations. For each limitation, you need to provide an explanation on how you can improve it. And in my last paragraph of my evaluation section, I also have like a section where I compare the significance of the systematic error and a random error. I never did that before, but in my teacher's checklist that he provided us, he wanted us to do that. So I just have like a paragraph to talk about it. In reality, because like my actual chemistry IA was two points lower than the grade that my teacher gave me. So it, this section may have been a three out of six because of all these stuff that I did do. Now we have arrived at the last section of your IA, which is the extension part. This part, people often forget about it. To be honest, I think I didn't do well in this section because my extension suggestions were very superficial. And like the IB against that, some extensions involve like replacing something with another and stuff like that is very superficial and not enough to meet their expectation. And I think this was my case because mine was about like the change in the independent variable intervals and also like adding more independent variables and stuff like that and I don't think that was in-depth enough to meet their expectation. So yeah, I think now you know that this is not what they're looking for so um, you need to work harder to talk about things more in-depth when you actually come to your section. Sometimes I don't know what the IB wants but at least now you know that what I have here is definitely not enough and in the extensions section what you can do is always to propose a new research question uh, at the end to end your overall overall chemistry IA. And lastly, definitely have your work cited. If you have a lot of work cited and you want to know how to mush all of your work cited into one place, I did that for my biology IA and it was a lifesaver to cut it down to 12 pages. So stay tuned for that uh, because my bio IA did a lot more better than my chemistry IA. It was a 7 and scored a 22 out of 24. That's it for my chemistry IA. There are a lot of things that I could have done better to help me score a better mark. I hope you guys found it helpful in terms of learning my mistakes and looking at the overall structure of my eye and how I approached it and things like that. And we just reached 100 subscribers on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for that. See you in my next video. So yeah, thank you for watching. Bye.